Welcome to On Fighting in Thailand, the best news and analysis covering the economics and infrastructure of Muay Thai. I'm Matt Lucas, journalist, commentator, and ex-Muay Thai fighters. Make stronger fighters, make stronger people. Today we will be talking to Jaleel Barnes as part of our series on Muay Thai Gram. We will be covering the sponsored athletes of Muay Thai Gram. So Angela Chang, Jaleel, Omar Halalbi, and Brogan Stewart. As always, if you'd like to reach me, you can follow me on Instagram, Matt Lucas Muay Thai, or email me at a period Matt period Lucas at gmail.com. Also, my website, www.matt-lucas.com. Thanks to everyone that supported me so far, sharing the podcast, leaving reviews. If you'd like to leave a review, that would be super helpful. You can do so on the iTunes store. As always, a book plug. I have published I'm Fighting in Thailand. It's a guide to the sport in the motherland. It goes over scoring, matchmaking, picking a gym, fight styles, gambling, Muay Thai culture, and more. It has a series of uh, interviews with long-term expat fighters, including Michael Savas, Willie Whipple, Lisa Breely, Angela Chang, and others. Uh, you can get it in print or as an ebook off of Amazon. So again, that's I'm Fighting in Thailand. Thanks to my sponsors, Knock Muay Legends, for their continued support of the show. They create some great Muay Thai apparel with portions of the proceeds going back to the legends they celebrate. All the superstars have been paid for their images as well. Check out their gear at www.knockmuaylegends.com. Use On Fighting to get 15% off your order. Thanks, as always, to Patrick Rivera for helping get this show started. I think when this episode airs, his gyms in Sacramento and some of the California area have shut down again. So obviously tough times for a lot of people in America and around the world because of COVID. But I believe in Patrick. He's doing a great job pivoting and really helping Muay Thai as a business grow. So I really appreciate his support. A little bit about our guest today, Jaleel Barnes. So I met Jaleel in person uh, six or seven months ago. At the beginning of the year, he was training out of FA Group, which I, of course, am friendly with, having worked there for quite some time. And he fought a couple times out of the gym. Also, his trainer, Aaron Boggs, is frequently looks at my content and shares it, especially my Instagram. So I was pretty aware of Jaleel through Aaron and then also seeing him at FA Group. He was at Llama Moons and Marcy Maxwell um, said that he was quite good. So I met him. He, We talked briefly. He went to Chiang Mai and then he connected with me again and that's really when we started working together and when we started working on Muay Thai Muay Thai Gram together so without further ado the interview with Jaleel Barnes so thank you Jaleel for coming on the show today I really appreciate you taking your time out of course So let's get down to the nitty gritty of it. Mm -hmm. What drives you? What? Why are you out here? What part brings you through this? Um, This is actually a question that I ask myself a lot (laughs) because I don't have this like, you know, like my parents died in a birding building type why. But I think ever since I was a kid, like I watched all the corny kung fu movies of like some dude who like goes across the world and like trains and becomes a monk and you know does martial arts and stuff and I always thought that was like the coolest lifestyle so I was like okay when I grow up like in third grade we had the career project and my job was like I wanted to be a ninja (laughs) and they're like that's not like a real job I think it is a real job yeah I think like in (laughs) Japan there's like a village that's looking for ninjas I might, after I'm done with Muay Thai, I might look into that. (laughs) But yeah, my why is just like, I think it's just who I am. Like, you know, I just love to fight. I love martial arts Um, and just like bettering myself. So obviously bettering yourself, everyone says that sort of stuff. Everyone Mm -hmm. 
you hear about the positive shit all the time. Yeah, but yeah. obviously, you're out here, you're fighting, you go through shitty times. Mm-hmm. Um, what, exa- what is an example of a hardship you went through, and how did you feel when you were overcoming that? Um, I think a hardship that I went through and am still going through, I moved here, like, right pre-COVID, you know? And just... It, it was kind of a different Thailand. Like, the Thais don't talk to you, or they see you walking towards the elevator, they'll hold up and close the door. And, like, you know, they're just really. And I'm here by myself, so it was, like, really lonely. And I kind of just got. I honestly got this bad taste in my mouth for Thai people. Like, right off the bat, I was just like, okay, they're just shitty. Like, no one wants to talk to me. How am I supposed to learn Thai if I can't speak to people? Like, and, like, it was just a hardship of, like, being like, this is not you know, real time. This is not normal life. You know, people are scared. They're scared. They're not, you know, as educated as you, you know. I think one. even educated people and yeah. in reputedly educated prob- <laughs> uh, areas of the world yeah. are having problems right now. So yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not going to say any country in specific <laughs> America, but, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and it was just, it was hard, like, trying to be a normal, not pessimistic person during that whole time. Yeah. I think it's also hard because I do agree with you. I I feel like a lot of ties were on edge, especially at the beginning of yeah. Corona. I feel like people have loosened up a lot more. Yes, for sure. But I think that the loneliness and sense of estrangement mm-hmm. is real. Mm-hmm. You know, living abroad for a long period of time, you yeah. know, more than three months yeah. is going to make you feel weird. Yeah. It's going to make you feel very different. And you're going to, you are not Thai. Mm-hmm. You are not from this country. Yeah. I think it's a very good experience to feel, especially because not a lot of Americans travel outside of the country. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like America where. You know, you can be Asian, you can be black, you can be white, and people might just assume, you know, maybe you're from another country, but you're probably American, you know? Mm-hmm. Here, yeah. it's like, you're definitely not Thai. You're just <laughs> Falang. You're just yeah. foreigner, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, do you feel you've overcome that? Like, what, how have you built up a resilience to that problem, or how, have you solved that problem? Um, I think it's, it was a bigger problem than I was thinking it was it wasn't just you know oh they're scared and they're treating me different it was a lot of there are so many smaller cultural differences that i wasn't just picking up on you know it's like it's culture shock honestly like there are things that i was like okay this is just stupid that thai people do it this way but it's not stupid it's just different you Mm -hmm. know and i'm bringing my own biases from where i used to live over here and just labeling it stupid when really it's just i need to learn how to accept it and yeah i am be, uh, I am starting to accept these things not like that it's good or bad but it's just different and it's just how things work so yeah I'm coming along I do think it takes a long time to understand Thailand's point of view Yeah. because the things that they do and the way they see things make sense mm-hmm. if you're looking through their eyes mm-hmm. but it's difficult for foreigners especially to look through their eyes and sort of understand their viewpoint which is where a lot of confusion comes from and you know when you look back at your own country and your own like origins there's a lot of stuff that we do which is pretty fucking stupid (laughs) you know (laughs) it's just dumb yeah i mean there i i'm not saying thailand is this paradise Mm because it's not yeah but there's a lot of things that the west fucks up on as well and I think my first time, this is my second time in Thailand, my first time I saw only the good things. Mm-hmm. You know, I was here for like two months, two plus months, and I was just like, oh, it's so amazing, yeah. you know? And then I move here and I'm like, okay, you start to see... Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's things that are fucked up. Yeah. And there's, especially when you stay long term, mm-hmm. you see more, yeah. you see the real life, yeah. which that means you see the good things, yeah. you know, that you won't see short term yeah like okay great thing about thailand is that mm. you can eat fruit every day yeah. you know fruit salad <laughs> oh my god it's amazing yeah but you're not gonna see like the long-term good things like yeah. you know kids 
in Muay Thai growing up mm -hmm. and going through things. And that right. can be a really powerful experience. Yeah. You're also not going to see like some of the long term bad things as well. Yeah. You know, kids growing up yeah. and going through experiences, yeah. which it can be very rough. Yeah. Um, but I guess backtracking a little bit, how mm -hmm. did you begin? You started at Ronin Training Center with um, Boggs, right? So I, Boggsies? So Boggsies, <laughs> my man! Uh, shout out uh, Coach Aaron Boggs at Ronin Training Center, first and foremost. Um, but no, I started, um, honestly, I started on YouTube videos, watching martial arts on YouTube videos, <laughs> before I could afford a gym membership, before I could get a job. And... I loved MMA at this time, right? Because it was I was like, oh, Anderson Silva, yada, yeah, yada, yada. How, how old were you? 30? 40? What, what? Is this some type of... That's obviously a joke. You're 22. Oh, I'm 22 now, so I was probably <laughs> like 16 before I could get up 15, before I could get a job. And once I got my first job, I was like, yeah, find the closest MMA gym so I could train MMA. And it was like this gym, Top Dog MMA. And I trained there for some time while I was in high school. And I started wrestling because of it, because everyone in MMA was like, man, I wish I would have wrestled. So I was like, all right, I'm going to wrestle my last two years of high school. So I wrestled my last two years of high school, and I started with MMA at Top Dog. And then something happened where the trainers left. They moved to mm -hmm. Florida. So I needed a new gym. So And Ronan was like this legit gym in Columbus. I lived like 45 minutes away. Mm -hmm. So I was like, let me just try it out. I went to Ronan. I did an MMA class there. And then I did, this was my first time ever doing like a full like Muay Thai only class, right? Because I did MMA and I did it with Coach Boggs and I was like, yeah, I love this. Yeah, this is the shit. Yeah, and I just, because with MMA I felt it was just a mosh posh of so many different martial arts. But then when I found Muay Thai and I looked up the videos, it just had like this culture, this identity, this tradition, like a whole different type of beauty to it. And so I dropped MMA. And was, yeah. Um, so you fought most of your career in America out of Ronin, or your entire career. Yep. Okay. Entire, um, and you fought at a lot of the tournaments. You fought mm -hmm. if on one of the IFMA teams. Yep. Can you? I actually have never been to the tournaments in the states. What mm -hmm. was that experience like? You fought at TBAs twice. Oh man, I fought at TBAs three times. Mm -hmm. I think three times and fought at Rev Gear twice. I have fought at the yeah Pam, Peterson there their events a lot but it was amazing because once i started muay thai i dove into it i knew all the fighters i knew everyone there was to know so going to these big those those big events i'm seeing all these people who i kind of like hold at like celebrity mm -hmm. level like i would see like asa tin pal you know walk past me and i'd be like hi uh -huh. asa and he'd hey. turn around like who said that and i'd be like oh <laughs> so like yeah just seeing people. i like florida yeah <laughs> Seeing people like him and a bunch of other Troy, Trouble Jones, oh, yeah, like those guys, I looked up to them, mm -hmm. and I was like, man, like I wanna, I wanna, I, I was jealous, like I wanna be on the U.S. team, I wanna do all this stuff, you know. So doing all those competitions was amazing. It's like a big gathering mm -hmm. of Muay Thai people, you know, who just love Muay Thai. Yeah, and so you won TBAs. I won TBAs, uh, C class, A and A class twice. Mm-hmm. And how many times did you fight in the tournaments? Um, C, um, when I fought C-Class, I fought three times. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. And then I fought A-Class. My first time fighting A-Class, I fought twice. Oh, that's and okay. My third time fighting A-Class, I only got one fight. Uh, whatever. Yeah. That's okay, though. Yeah. And so what was uh, if my experience like? How did you get on the team? Where did you go? Oh. Who was on the team? The coaches? All that <laughs> sort of stuff. All right, so... I'm going to let you in on my whole how I got on the team plan. Me and Boggies. Yeah. I love Coach Boggies because this is like we had we set goals and then we just planned on how the hell we were mm. going to do them, right? That That is a very, very good piece of advice yeah. for people to do. Yeah. And like I see Just people, write shit down and then, yeah. you know, tackle it. And coordinate with your coaches. Like I see some gyms or their coaches are like, we do everything and you just shut up and you take the fights we get. And it's like. But it's your career. You need yeah. to put it into your hands. That's, you know, a little bit. Respectfully. A little bit. Yeah, respectfully, I agree with that. Communication is key with your coach. Yeah. And me and Boggy's communicated. Like, what are we going to do? You know what? I was, I was feeling ignored, you know? So I was like, okay, every fight, I'm, these are the people I'm going to target. Because these are the people who have been on the team. Or, or the eyes are on them. And every time I fight, we're going to send uh, to uh, Corley. 
Hey, mm-hmm. Jalil just won this fight against this person. You know, every yeah. single time. So, and that's all we did. We just went around not picking opponents, just like taking, you know, taking mm-hmm. names yeah. every time. And yeah, we just went around the country just <laughs> taking names, you know, and eventually. Who, we're, who were some of the people that you fought in America? Uh, names Kevin Rhodes, Preston Anderson. These are all guys oh, who are yeah. like, I looked up to initially, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, Kevin Rhodes, Preston Anderson. Um, oh my gosh, his name escapes me right now. Um, I'm sorry that I'm forgetting you. Dutch, you know who you are. I'm, I can't think of your name right now. It's okay. But yeah, just. I, I know Preston. He yep. came out here a while ago. Mm-hmm. Was, he was out here for a short period of time. He yeah. probably should have stayed longer. Um, yeah. And then I know Kevin Rhodes is somewhat <laughs> active in America. Yeah. What was the If My Experience itself like? You fought in the Pan Ams in South uh, America? It was a South American Cup in Colombia. Yeah, it was amazing. Like, it was, it was, uh, it was one of the most amazing experiences I've had. Just because we clicked the team, everyone, mm-hmm. we clicked immediately. Who who was on the team? Press, uh, not Preston, sorry, Kevin Rhodes, me, Ahmed, uh, Yasmin, um, Brandon Kurosawa, Philip Ignacio, uh, and I'm forgetting one more person. Who? Oh, Ryan Faithy. Um. And who else? Was there anyone? I'm sorry if I'm forgetting. A lot of those guys have gone on and are continuing to fight. Yasmin is fighting, I think, in Mexico soon. Yeah. She just switched over to boxing club with Jesse Magson. Yes. Um, And then uh, Brandon also recently fought in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I think he's fighting in Mexico soon, And guess who he's fighting in Mexico? He's fighting Philip Ignacio, who was on the team. Yeah. Oh. So I'm excited to watch them. I told them to make it more exciting than me and Kevin's fight. <laughs> but, yeah, so, and we just, we all clicked. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the coaches, Marcy, J- Coach Magnuson. Marcy is dope. She's awesome. Oh, who were some of the other coaches? Sorry. Coaches, Ricardo Perez. Oh, he cool. A really sweet guy. Uh, you know Rami was yep. there. Uh, Marcy, like we just said. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then all the fighters. And how many times did you fight, and what was that experience like? Mm, Okay, I fought three times in total. Uh, The first fight, it was was the experience overall. It was a cool experience. Some of the countries, it was cool to see where America's Muay Thai level was in comparison to some of the South American countries. Where, Uh, Where would you say the Americans' level was at? America's number one. In terms of the North America and South yeah, America? Was Canada of, there? No, Canada was not there. Um, Peru is a good country that was there. Mexico had some killers. Um, all the Every country had, like, you know, one or two good fighters. Brazil had some good fighters, but I think America... We just were... We really were on our shit, that tournament. Mm-hmm. Like I said, we all clicked, and it was, like, a good chemistry, and... We just, we killed it. Did I say Coral was on the team too? Oh, you did yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Coral, Coral is pretty active. Of course. And yeah. She's quite good. Um, she had that fight a while ago with Nicole Fernandez. Oh, really? Yeah, she she beat Nicole Fernandez. It was a very good fight. You mm-hmm. know, I, I Nicole is one of the, I think, one of the leading lights in her weight class. And yeah. Coral beat her, and it was good. Yeah. You know, good for Coral. I think... Is she signed to Glory or what? Coral. Coral. I think she did have a big sign. Yeah, I'm not sure. But mm-hmm. hopefully, you know, she gets back to fighting as well. Yeah. Um. Does. So after IFMA, was that when you went overseas, came out here for the first time? Um, My first time? No, that was before IFMA. My first time was last year, 2019, January. I went to Lamna Moon, so yeah. I camp in Ubon. Which is a very underrated gem. Yes. Like, yes. It, I think more foreigners need to go to Isan, mm. and Lama Moon's gym is a is pretty perfect in a lot of ways. It's very perfect. Lama Moon takes like I'm not even gonna, I'm not gonna say he spoils you. He looks out for you mm-hmm. when you're there. He takes really good care of you. Like, I want him to come back to Thailand so I can go over to him <laughs> and like show him some love because he really took care. of of all of us. And we still have guys who went over after that trip and he took really good care of them, you know? 
Yeah, if people are unfamiliar with Lama Moon, who's the vampire knee of Uban Ratchatani, mm. a late golden era fighter, uh, Lama Moon Sor Sumali, mm. he, um, he developed a, a lot of foreign fighters as well. Yeah. His own career was very good. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he, he won a couple of Lumpini or Raja Demnern Bill. Four-time Lumpini champion. There you go. You got it. I I should have known that because I helped build out his website, but I can't remember. Um, but he, he built a lot of good guys like yeah. uh, Sean Kearney. Mm-hmm. Um, he built uh, Jordan Coe, yep. who unfortunately passed away. Um, Curtis Stotty, mm-hmm. uh, Maroon Halal was there for a while. He's, he knows how to make foreigner yeah. fighters. And that's not something all Thai trainers know how to do because it's different. That's true, 100%. So you obviously had a few fights out of Lama Moons. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? Well, these were my first fights in Thailand, so they were, like, mind-boggling. Every single fight was, like, (laughs) it just blew my mind, like, how fights went on here, you know? I knew it was wild, and... Every fight we went to, we were coming with Lamna Moon, of course. So, yeah. you know, eyes were on us. Mm-hmm. And we were, like, the only foreigners fighting on the card. I had dreads at the time, too. So I was, like, you know. Up. So weird. Yeah, people were. I mean, for for Isan, it's, yeah. like, yeah, probably never seen a person with dreads. Yeah, many other Probably people. never seen a black person. Yeah, <laughs> let alone a black person with dreads. And it was... It was just wild. The kids, my first fight, there were a group of kids who followed me everywhere. I was getting oiled down. They were right there. I went up to sit on the podium because I was the next fight. They went up and sat right next to me. I'm like, Yo. You had an entourage. I know. I had an entourage. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, how many fights did you have in the countryside? Uh, I was there for two months. I had three fights. Yeah, that's very good. I think that's one of the great things about fighting in the countryside as well. Mm-hmm. Lots of regular fights they're yeah. very low pressure mm-hmm. it's a bit disorganized but it's yeah. low pressure it's a lot of really good experience so yeah. i think that is something a lot of americans really miss out on um, yeah and it's also important because a lot of times isan is the birthplace of the sport mm-hmm. you know a lot a lot of fighters are coming from the rural northeast yeah and you can see it man when you watch those little kid fights like, they fight with perfect technique, and they mm-hmm. never get tired, and it just blows my mind. So, after you were at Lama Moons for a while, you mm-hmm. came back, and then you yep. went, you got on the IFMA team. Yep. And then, what happened after, oh, how did you do in IFMA? IFMA had three fights, I won all three, I got gold. Oh, bam. Fought Ecuador, fought Peru, and fought Brazil. Oh, good, Yeah, good. so. Um, good. So you got gold in the Pan Ams, and then you came back with some bling. Came with the bling, of course. And then what What happened next? And then after that, I went to... Um, oh, I had already got my... Uh, no, I didn't already buy my ticket. The next month, I bought my ticket to come to Thailand. Mm. After I came back from Thailand my first time, I had a plan that I was moving here. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. it was already set that it was happening. But I came back in December, and then in February... <laughs> yeah, I I, re- I sort of remember Marcy saying something about it. Oh, mm. this kid Jaleel, he's really good. Mm. He said he's going to move. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, whatever. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. because, <laughs> you know, a lot of people will say they're going to do something, but don't do it. And yeah. a lot of Americans will be like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to come out. I'm going to come out. Yeah, man. And there are not many americans out here no and i see there's a lot of guys with crazy talent and i'm like man just come yeah just come and the i mean the thing is it's not as hard as people think Mm -hmm. it is harder in some ways like we were talking before but it's not as hard as people think but you know more people need to do it basically once they jump that gap it's so you came out here in February, so talk a little bit about what coming out here at first was like. Where did you go? <laughs> what happened to you? So I landed here uh, Monday morning pretty much, almost at midnight mm-hmm. uh, on the Sunday, Monday. And so I waited five hours, took a taxi straight to FA Group, <laughs> and they were getting ready to do their morning run. I dropped my stuff off, and I ran with the team. Oh, that's so early. Yeah, and I mean... You know, I I was... I, I trained at the gym for 
a year and a half, and I worked there for a year. I never went on one morning run. What? Not it, one? Not one. It was so early. What? Yeah, it was so <laughs> early. I I lived away from the gym, uh, yeah. and I never went on the morning runs. So I was like, Bruh, fuck that. Never uh, once. Yeah, never once. Anyways, but you got up. You went running to Chattuchuk Park. Yep. Actually, maybe I did it twice. Yeah. But probably not. I can't remember. After so. and a whole year, that's not a lot. Twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> twice in a month isn't a lot. <laughs> Let alone. <laughs> so you you went running. Yeah. You got off the plane literally and went running. Yeah, I hopped off, went running, and I was lucky as hell because I got to be Yotin's partner. For, mm-hmm. You know, every day I was there. I mean, four days into training. Uh, you know, I was training hard as hell. Four days into training, after morning training, Crew D was like, hey, you fight tonight. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. Well, wait. And he's like, ah, sabai, sabai. Yeah. I'm like, all right, cool. So I fought in Ayutthaya, uh, yeah, like my fourth day. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that fight go? You Didn't you win by knockout? Yeah, I won by knockout. It was, uh, how much did you make for it? What was your opponent like? Uh, my opponent was, he used to be really good back in the day. I was yeah. told uh, Sanpon or Dechapon or something. He was like a big fighter back in the day. Mm-hmm. But kind of, you know, near yeah. the end of his. Made 4,000 baht that fight. So not a ton? Not a ton, no. Um, yeah, I cut him up. I gave him like three cuts. Oh. So after the fight, I went and apologized to him, and you know. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of stitches, especially for you know a four thousand bot fight. Yeah. It's sort of like, uh, I know like when I've gone out to the countryside and fought. Um, a lot of times I'll fight out of War with mm-hmm. Francis, and she'll be like, "Oh, you know, don't use elbows." You, yeah. You're not really making that much money. Yeah. You don't want to get caught. They don't want to get caught. Like, yeah. you know, gentleman's agreement mm-hmm. is you don't elbow so much. But yeah, I mean, first it's round, a game was, as well. Yeah, first round he kind of hit. He hit me with a really hard hook that like dazed me. Round one, so I was oh. like, okay, the fight yeah. starts now. You know, yeah. <laughs> he, maybe he was like, oh, uh, Ginmu. Yeah. Oh, I go, I he's go. fat he's got a finisher no 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 <laughs> like Ginmu is like uh, to eat pig like mm. oh the foreigner is easy oh uh, you know so you can say that like mm. or sometimes the Thai commentators will be like my moo my moo mm-hmm. like not a pig not yeah. e- not easy meat oh. you know my moo yeah mm. so Oh, I'm I'm not like a tomato can. I'll have to get a shirt that says that and wear it to my fights. <laughs> yeah. My moo. Yeah, you're you're no pig. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no pig. Um, and so you had the fight in Utah. Mm-hmm. Um, how long were you at FA Group, and did you have any other fights? Yeah, I was at FA Group for three weeks total, and I had two fights. I had that fight on my fourth day, and then uh, like a week and a half later, I got to fight at Lumpini mm. on two days' notice. Um, it was awesome. Yeah. Well, it was the second to last show before Lumpini closed Yeah. <laughs> because of COVID. So it was an empty stadium, just, you know, the fighters and a few staff workers, but it was amazing. I fought a guy from Uzbekistan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was a good fight. By Ginmu Lublau. Mm. No, he was he was a difficult. He, uh, was, he, was, he was pretty good. Yeah. So a lot of the Uzbekistan fighters are, have more of a kickboxing background. Yeah. I would say, in general, are not very strong. Yeah. He was definitely a puncher kicker. Mm-hmm. Not strong in the clinch. That's where I took him over. You yeah. know, and outscored him. I got his back a few times, and I was just like, yeah. Okay. That's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, you made like six thousand baht for that uh, fight. Man, how much did I get paid for the Lumpini fight? Probably six. I don't yeah. remember, but I know it wasn't four. Yeah. The Omar has fought on there once, and Ethan... Um, Ethan... Mm-hmm. Uh, Kwai Chong. Ki Chong. I yeah, yeah. I always <laughs> fuck up his name. I'm so terrible. Ethan Quinoa. Yeah. From <laughs> Wooden Man. <laughs> yeah, Ethan from Wooden Man fought there. <laughs> um, it was the Lumpini World Champion Show, which was a good... Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it's... I think it's the same one you fought on, okay. bro. Really? The uh, the Saturday night show. It's mm. not super high level. Mm. The pay was like six thousand baht. Mm. It's not amazing, but it's yeah, good experience. It's really good you experience. know, it's very good experience. 
it's a little bit of a step up from the countryside. Yeah. But it's not like, you know, a massive jump. Yeah. Um, so, and then COVID happened. Yeah. And then COVID happened. So, you were at FA Group. Yeah. Cracking along. Everything was shutting down. They're like, okay, we're going to have to send everyone home soon. So, I had my friend Tucker who lives in Chiang Mai. I was like, okay, I'll go visit Tucker for a while. And I got it when I got up to Chiang Mai. That's when like provincial travel shut yeah. down, you know. So everything locked shut down. down. Yeah, lockdown here. And uh, so I ended up having to. I was on a tourist visa at the time, sixty days. So I was like, okay, I need to switch over to a student visa fast. So and to have a student visa, you need a place. You need a residence. So I had to get a condo. I got a condo, and then I got my student visa in Chiang Mai. So yeah. Only three months at FA. Mm. Um, or three weeks at FA. Yeah, and then you're in Chiang Mai. Uh, what happened? Mm. You know, yeah. how long were you've been up there for a while? Yeah. Obviously, um, where did you start training? What mm. was it like during quarantine? Yeah, during quarantine. Oh, yeah, quarantine and lockdown. Me and Tucker trained just with each other in his yeah. yard during quarantine. You know, and then uh, once I started looking for a place. I can't. I walked across Sit Dabwad, which is this. It's an old. I, I heard they used to have a good amount of champions back in the day, but it's just a home, a little home gym now. Mm-hmm. And the owner of the gym let us train there for free. That's cool. So yeah, me and Tucker started training there, um, all COVID long, pretty much, mm-hmm. until um, gyms started to open back up. Mm-hmm. And then we, uh, I went to War Santai. I started training at Hong Tong for like a month, mm-hmm. and then I went to War Santai, mm-hmm. where I'm at now. And you've been at War, War Santai for three or four months now. Yeah, about three or four four yeah. months. It's a solid gym for sure. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, on the outskirts of Chiang Mai. Mm-hmm. They've had like a couple of good foreigners there, like uh, Lisa Breely yeah. and Ian Greer mm-hmm. from Minnesota yeah. uh, was there for a little bit. What is training there like? Um, it's very good. They have a specific Sunday style where it's um, it's like a stadium, beautiful, mm-hmm. you know, it's like a visually pleasing uh, mm-hmm. style. And I wouldn't say I'm a visually pleasing fighter, so it's really good for me to get this perspective of fighting. It's improved my game. I wasn't seeing much change in my game in the first few months. In like month one and month two, I felt like I was kind of like faking you know, the Sentai style, but then now I'm seeing how it's, like, developing into my style, Mm -hmm. and I'm really appreciating it. The, I went there once and did pad works with Sock, Mm -hmm. uh, who's a very good trainer there, one of the head trainers, and he definitely has a distinctive style. Yeah. Which, I, when I look at Lisa Mm Breely, I definitely see, uh, and it's good. They also have a low money, I think was there for a bit. Yeah. Uh, War Santai, another good lightweight fighter. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously you you started training at War Santai, and mm-hmm. then we we hooked up. We met up at around sometime then, right? Yeah. Uh, we met up. The first time we met was when I was training at FA Group. I went to Super Champ to corner one of my friends. That's oh, when I first yeah, yeah. met you. Yeah, and I was <laughs> like, "Hey, what up?" Yeah, you were like, hi, I'm Matt Lucas. Yeah. And then you shook my hand, and then someone else came over, and you started shaking his hand, too, at the same time. Oh, really? And you shook both of our hands for, like, ten seconds straight. Yeah, I'm a double shaker. I was like, this dude's kind of (laughs) weird. Let go of my hand already. Oh, you're hating. (laughs) You're you're just hating. Um, So let's go um, talk a little bit about your first fight at Max. When Uh was... uh, This is your fifth? Fight this Max? will be my fourth fight. Fourth fight, so it was like four Ju- yeah. four months ago. July, so. July. Um, like I, mm-hmm. I can't remember that much. Yeah, because there's always like so many fights all the time. It's yeah, I fought Kung Kla, someone from Chiang Mai. Uh huh. <laughs> um, it was a good fight. It was just like a like knocking the rust off, seeing where I'm at, like mm. also developing our relationship and seeing yeah, like, what yeah. we want to like work at and build off on. So it was a just a good fight. Yeah. I, oh yeah, Ali McOney was in your corner. Ali, Tucker, Tucker came down and yeah. you know, we went and had 
a few beers after you were a good boy <laughs> yeah and didn't drink yeah, I, I was like i don't drink alcohol yeah i was like oh he's a little square but at least he's not getting into trouble square square but i'm sharp though so um since then you've ha- you've had a few more fights at max what have mm-hmm. those fights been like yeah the competition just keeps getting tougher next fight i fought boon Lai. um yeah, he's, he's tricky. Really he's technical good. guy. Yeah, he's and solid fighter. Yeah, I just made him fight my fight and, you know, came out victorious. And then I fought uh, Thomas, Sword Chicharoon. Yeah, which, he's a former stadium level yeah, fighter. He was much harder to, like, make fight my fight. It was mm-hmm. more of a um, dog fight, per se. But in the later rounds, I got to him mm-hmm. just pre- pressing the pace. So, all in all, I'd say... Yeah. Well, did you knock out Thomas or you won on no, points? I went on did points. I got a. I dropped him in the third. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I yeah. can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> it's and so I got hard. I excited and tried yeah. to knock him out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I remember. <laughs> and you, your, yeah, your I got form all went wild. I was like, oh, fuck. Jaleel, yeah. you know, yeah. it's okay. You like, weren't too happy, but I was really happy. <laughs> yeah. I had fun. <laughs> was that Thomas was the one where you got cut across the cheek? Yeah, he cut me on my cheek, and it was an elbow that missed. Yeah. It just grazed me. Um, so you've obviously been to a few gyms now. Mm-hmm. How do they differ? What sort of common threads do you see in the gyms out here in Thailand? Oh, common threads? I'd say everyone – the common thread is everyone runs – Everyone clinches, everyone hits pads, everyone hits the bag, mm-hmm. you know, and everyone trains hard. Um, but some of the differences, like at FA group, after you run, you clinch for like, you know, oh, 30 minutes mornings. plus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. so much clinching at yeah. FA. Yeah, you clinch immediately. Yeah. And I think there's just little things, like it's one ring, there's mad people in the yeah, ring, yeah, you it's know? Yeah, real... And cramped. you have to be, like, aware, yeah. you know? And it just yeah increases your clenching, like, just a bit more. The the guys at FA are always very, very strong. Oh, my gosh, yeah. It's not like, I would not say it's the most technical of gyms, mm-hmm. but everyone's very, very strong. Yeah. They do what they do, and they do it well. Yeah, you know? for sure, for sure. <laughs> and then what about Llama Moons and, uh, versus uh, War Sentai? Oh, and, yeah. You know, Lamna Moon, um, when I was there, it was good because Lamna Moon being um, a knee fighter, we had a lot of, you know, knee critique and knee technique. Mm-hmm. But he also, one of the trainers that was there was Rung Rat mm-hmm. Ma Chek Bin, mm-hmm. which was he. Here, here comes the check. Yeah. Ma Chek Bin. Yeah, when he like, punches uh, you, he's asking for the check. Yeah. You know? And he actually, he beat Yod Kun Pan, the elbow hunter of 100 stitches, oh. cut up Yod Kun Pan oh. with punches. So I got to work with him and like just it was it was a plethora of knowledge there, you mm-hmm. know, and it was just really hard. Isan long training, you know, mm-hmm. long, hard training, <laughs> which was really good for me. And then at uh, Sentai, it's like I said, much more technical. I train a lot with Shui, who is like a femur, really smart fighter. Um, and it's kind of like a normal regime training wise. It's mm-hmm. not like. FA where it's like the clenching sticks out to me but yeah they just teach you how to look good and how Mm -hmm. to fight smart so speaking of looking good and fighting smart mainly looking good (laughs) (laughs) what is your lifestyle out here how do you keep good looking how do you stay good looking regular haircuts shout out to my moms for the staying good looking part (laughs) (laughs) Lifestyle wise, um, I really just train. I I like to keep a solid routine. Sometimes my routine will slack off, and like I'll start to feel crappy. So I like to, even if I don't like, if it's after a fight, I like to wake up early. I wake up at like five, and I'll read and write, and then uh, do like my morning run and work out around like six six thirty, and you know come home, eat, nap, and the Basic training regime really helps uh, keep me feeling like myself. Yeah. And you said you read and write in the mornings. What sort of stuff have you been reading? What sort of stuff have you been writing? Um, right now, I am reading The Inner Game of Tennis, which is like a 
it's like a new way to look at how to reach peak performance and he uses tennis as his like sport of choice but it's it's relative to all sports um and writing wise i i document like i've been writing i have a lot of prompts like i'm documenting my stay here uh writing just short stories about experiences i've had uh, creative writing on prompts that i've had and journaling pretty much have you read that many um sports psychology books at all um i've read a few not many like i've read uh what was the book called uh i forget what it's called it's the learning have you read this book before it uh, talks about myelin something. like the myelin and uh how like when you're learning something you're adding like fat to the strands of myelin in your brain called like the learning curve or something mm. like that no i have not um not many yeah the I do think sports psychology books are very good, Mm -hmm. very helpful, because a lot of the trials and tribulations that fighters go through, other athletes go through, it's slightly different, but there's still common threads, performance anxieties, you know, when you lose, when you win, how to do Mm -hmm. self-actualization, doing goal setting, blah, 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 like important things. Yeah. Um, I think... One of the best books I've read for it is called Killer Athletes, mm-hmm. where it pretty much is just a bunch of short, informative paragraphs that about special operations uh, military personnel and how they deal with performance anxiety, you know, in like the most extreme case scenario. And just uh, that really helped me get a good perspective for when I fight. And what do they specifically do? Um, like it'll talk about... Uh, butterflies Mm -hmm. and how butterflies is just blood leaving your stomach to go to your muscles because your body's getting ready to prepare Mm -hmm. you know so instead of for thinking of like oh I have butterflies like I'm just getting nervous I'm not ready it's like mo my body is getting ready Mm -hmm. to fight you know it's perfectly natural yeah a a lot of times I hear good level athletes or professional fighters sort of changing negative emotions into Mm -hmm. positive ones or not seeing a reaction in a negative manner, rather they reframe it. Yes. It's re- just that reframing of like, this is happening, it's a good thing, rather yeah. than this is happening, it's a negative thing. Yeah, that's a big thing that I've been dealing with. Uh, that I'm actually just fascinated with is mental toughness. And mental toughness is just reframing things that people might see as like curses or bad things that happen into just a challenge and an opportunity to like better yourself. You know. uh, speaking of bettering yourself, uh, you are now on the Muay Thai Gram team. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Shout out uh, Muay Thai Gram. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, one of the reasons for this interview. What? How did that happen? What do you think you can get out of the sponsorship? Mm-hmm. What do you sort of give? You know, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. How it happened is um, well, I've just been working with you and working my ass off to build not really like i haven't been working to build a profile for myself it's kind of just been happening you know like uh because i've just been working and i'm on social media and uh yeah it just came about muay thai Graham was looking for a, f- a few athletes to like have as ambassadors and to like help expose and to build you know and uh right place right time you know yeah what are some of the things that you feel you can get out of the relationship they have a huge following like muay thai Graham, and just being one of the ambassadors and to like rock that you know like they share my fights and make like cool ass posters and all, all these things for exposure and so it's really good for like my my profile and uh matt and helping me get my fights um just so many things that like a lot of people go without you know Mm -hmm. help or have to do themselves yeah um, that they take care of and then in some ways it ties in with some of your other sponsors can you Mm -hmm. talk about and you have two other sponsors, uh, Patrick Rivera and Economic Properties. Yeah. How did those come about? What are What's that relationship um, like? Those two are, okay, so Patrick Rivera, it's kind of the same. 
these two guys, uh, Economic Properties and Patrick Rivera, they really like see something in me, you know, and they like care about my journey a lot. Like Patrick Rivera, he's deep in the Muay Thai community, of course, and um, with him, I'm right now. Yeah, he just he just sees my vision and where and he believes in me, you know, and he wants to help me get there. So right now, um, yeah, he gives me a certain amount of money per fight, and that helps out like a ton. And the same thing with economic properties. Um, the guy who owns that, he just believes in me, you know, and wants to help wants to help me along the way. Like I, I'm very blessed. Like I have a lot of people in my corner who really just like believe that I can do it and it kind of like I'm like damn like I guess I really can do it like these dudes just like help me out so much so I'm really grateful for like my sponsors like really grateful for Patrick Rivera and Economic Properties Muay Thai Graham like it really humbles me you know yeah it's in a lot of ways I see it in a similar manner as like there's sort of two ways to look at it is one is just a patronage mm -hmm. uh so like you have patrons mm -hmm. with sort of the same thing as like a in the middle ages where it's like some you know a well-off guy yeah just likes fucking art so yeah. he pays an artist yeah he's like go make some yeah. fucking art like yeah. i love it i i think in some ways it's the same yeah um and then the other way is to look at it is like a little bit more of a career development side mm -hmm. so people in higher positions or and positions in authority are looking for people to bring up mm -hmm. to build not their profile their brand and basically build the industry yeah. by building potential talent within the industry that makes sense so it's at least for Muay Thai Graham and speaking as what you know a Muay Thai mm -hmm. Graham owner it's that's sort of the way we're looking at it yeah. it's like okay we're building people within the community mm -hmm. as like talents and mm -hmm. representatives to mm -hmm. give them skills mm -hmm. and resources that they might not have had otherwise yeah. and in the process of doing so we're also learning skills um, obviously I'm making a lot of the posters. Yeah. The first posters I made were ugly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, they weren't like that bad, but yeah. like they weren't they weren't cool. Yeah. But I definitely feel like, you know, okay, I had to do it all the time yeah. and I was like, man, this sort of sucks, you know? Uh -huh. I got to get better at this. Um and now they're cool. Yeah, and they're, dope. they're I think at least that they're better than a lot of the fight posters in America, you <laughs> yeah. know? Yeah. And, you know, that's that's important. That's, mm -hmm. like, a real skill to have developed. Definitely. I agree. Like, it's not the corny flames and, like, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the flames yeah. and skull and crossbones. Like, it's legit posters and it's pleasing to and that. The other thing is that it's showing other athletes this is something that they can do. Yeah. This is like an avenue for them. So mm -hmm. people listening, you have a fight coming up. A very, yeah. very easy thing to do is make a poster for yourself yeah. and put people that help you out on the poster. Yeah. And when they see their names, they become more invested in you. Yeah, for sure. Like put your gym name, you know, mm -hmm. put your mom or dad helps you out with like your gym membership. Yeah. Put, you know... Mr. Mom or you yeah, know, Mr. Mom, Mr. Mom, Mrs. Mr. Dad, Dad you there. know who, you know whoever. Like yeah. uh, for Omar, his parents su help support him, yeah. so his dad has a company, mm -hmm. um, and we just say, oh, Halaby Enterprises or whatever, yeah. um, and it makes his dad feel good because mm -hmm. his dad is his patron, yeah. and it's like, okay, he's seeing proof of you know, the work and the art that yeah. Omar is putting out and he's getting additional, you know, benefits from it. Yeah. I think me personally, like, I struggle with trying to find that, like, munif mutual beneficial relationship, especially with guys like Patrick Rivera and Economic Properties because, like, they're investing in, like, my passion, mm -hmm. right? Like, I would die for the things that I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like almost a priceless thing that they're doing that for me. So it's like, what could I even possibly do for these people that would like pay them back? You know, mm -hmm. 
I think the you know that lies in the patron side. Mm-hmm. You know, some some people just want to be like, I have a shitload of money or I have a shitload of resources. Yeah, here you go. Yeah, like who knows if this is ever gonna help me, but I don't care. Yeah, like I didn't have this opportunity before, so okay, fuck it, just help you. You know, yeah. whatever. That makes sense. I mean, I I think that's the way, you know, some people see it, at least. Yeah. Um. So, obviously, you've been out here for a while now. Mm-hmm. Um. What are some of, and this is a little bit of a tired question, but still like asking it. What do you feel some of the differences are between here and the States? And mainly in terms of Muay Thai and Muay Thai culture. In Muay Thai, um, oh, we kind of talked about it earlier today like uh and this is just something that's prevalent to me is um i know we respect our trainers in america you know to a certain extent but here a teacher period your trainer your muay thai trainer is a teacher your thai language teacher is a teacher and there's such a high respect for your crew you know your teacher and sometimes in america we think money equals you know respect so like oh i pay my trainer every month like I'm doing my end of the bargain now he but they don't they expect more of a culturally like they want affection mm-hmm. you know they want like hey Jen how you doing maybe in between rounds like massage him let you know let him know that you like love him you know show him like like treat him like you would someone you really hold endearing you know and like I think that's something just like treating people with more Because, I mean, me, when I'm in fight mode and training mode, I like to have fun, but sometimes I go into tunnel vision, you know, and I just get shit done, and I feel like that can come off as, oh, he's just, like, you know, uh, shit for long, just pays his dues and leaves, you know? Like, not, like, shit, but there's just small cultural differences that even if you're not trying to be disrespectful, you might be accidentally disrespectful Mm -hmm. if you're not paying close attention, you know? So you really have to take your time and, like, pay attention how do the Thai boys treat the trainers you know Mm -hmm. okay maybe I should do that like do they say hello to they go when they walk in do they say hello to every single person maybe I should say hello to every single Mm -hmm. person you know just little things like that yeah I do think that's a good point especially about the money relationship Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of foreigners come out here and assume that they're they're paying their dues so it's a service yeah and paying a the dues to be in a gym is not it's not a service mm-hmm. it's entry into a community yeah. and entry into a world i like that so when you're you're paying to enter into someone's house mm-hmm. and be potentially a long-term member of a family mm-hmm. and when you're doing that you need to care about the the family and you know there's can be people older than you that have more experience than you that want to help you 100 percent. and they're not they're not there just for the money yeah you know i mean it is a money thing it yeah. is absolutely a money thing mm-hmm. but it's not a hundred percent and people need to care about their yeah. trainers and care about the other fighters and yeah. you know doing little things like you were saying mm-hmm. a very good thing to do when you roll up into a gym for the first time is buy a bunch of sponsors. Yeah. Uh, after a fight, mm-hmm. buy some sponsors. Oh, you yeah. did really well. Okay. Maybe buy like your trainer a bottle of whiskey. Yeah. You this know? is free game guys. Yeah, yeah. Buy some eggs, like buy a dozen eggs, yeah, the, buy a bundle of bananas. Like, yeah, fruit, mm-hmm. fruit and food is always good to get, yeah. you know, people like t- t-shirts, yeah. jeans, yep. like, you know, stuff like that where mm-hmm. You know, it wouldn't really register with us, but mm-hmm. it goes a long way. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I care about you. Okay, mm-hmm. here's some, you know, here's some stuff. Yeah. Um. So I guess wrapping things up, was there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't talk about? Um. I felt like we would have talked a little more on like the guys who want to come here Mm -hmm. but don't Mm -hmm. you know i feel like there are a lot of fighters even around my age who i can tell they want to fucking come here really bad you know 
and they just never do. Mm-hmm. And like, I am afraid for them to miss that opportunity to come. You know, I know this will probably be published during COVID, but like, listen, while it's COVID, you need to be fucking planning. Like, write down a plan about how you're gonna get here as soon as borders open. Like, if you've been telling yourself you're gonna come and you haven't, or you have a girlfriend, or you have a job, or your coach doesn't want you to come. It doesn't matter. Like, if this is something you want to do, you you have to make it happen. No one's gonna, no one's gonna do it for you, you know. So, like, let that be like your last warning from Jalil. <laughs> yeah, I mean that is very very true. One of the things yeah. about COVID is that it showed us things can happen, yeah. and your access to certain things can be cut off very very quickly. Yes, and you need to take advantage of the opportunities you have and americans and people abroad had lots of opportunity to come to thailand and fight and build themselves yeah some people have done it some people haven't you know if people are wavering or maybe thinking about it yeah when the doors open you need to come yeah everything other than action is inaction planning and thinking about it you know it's all in action until you actually do it you haven't done it yep. you know that's it really well thanks so much Jaleel for coming on the show I really appreciate you taking your time out thank you so much alright <laughs> later peace so that concludes the interview with Jaleel I really see big things going for him. He's a great guy, um, a great athlete as well with good work ethic and attitude. He's got a great mindset, so I can definitely see why he's gotten so far in America. I definitely you know, hope for the best for him as he's out here. It's been really great working with him over the last six months or so. He's had four fights at max. Hopefully he will have a fight at Moi Mans Wansuk soon. We are seeing what's happening there. And yeah, he's got a bright future. Great kid. Um, definitely advise following him on Instagram and other platforms. His IG name is Boy Kiao. See, so B U A K I E. Uh, let me look this up. Uh, B U A K I E O W underscore Muay Thai. So that's again, that's B U A K I E O W underscore Muay Thai. Great guy. Again, he's got a lot going on for him. So I am very happy to get the chance to support him. This has been I'm Fighting in Thailand, the best news and analysis covering the economics and infrastructure of Muay Thai. I'm Matt Lucas, journalist, commentator, and ex-Muay Thai fighter. Make stronger fighters, make stronger people.